Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I want to do a design study on a potential new horn waveguide for a 25 millimeter dome tweeter. And so this ties into a previous project where I'm attempting to come up with a high frequency solution for a two-way eight inch. So you can see it here, this is the new uh, eight inch purify woofer. And so to develop a high frequency solution that provides you know off-axis flat linear frequency response low distortion and uh, pattern control matchup at the crossover point um, so there's, there's a couple of requirements here and so I want to go through uh, this design and then the second part to this same video is showing you the objective test data so I'll have the horn printed and then do a full set of measurements including uh, listening impressions on that so so let's get into it. Um, I just wanted to spell out uh, some of the requirements and design goals here. So um, like I mentioned, it's the Peerless OC25 tweeter. At least that's what we're using uh, for now. Um, it's affordable. It performs really well. You've seen it there in previous projects for uh, the Circular Horn uh, number 1900. And so this new biradial is uh, number uh, 2007. And so um, just to go through, so the like I mentioned, there's a turnkey plan set that I'm trying to develop uh, for the new 8-inch Purify. And so we want low distortion. Actually, uh, before I get to that, I'll just go through it um, here. So well-behaved off-axis response that's free from diffraction and coloration. Um, and so you may um, remember in my previous video, I tested the 18 sound uh, XT120 horn mounted in the 30 centimeter wide baffle and so whether it was uh, attributable to the horn itself or just by virtue of mounting any horn in a baffle uh, we are getting pretty significant diffraction um, either from the horn or off the edges of the of the baffle and so we want it to be basically textbook perfect in in all the you know make it so that it checks off all the boxes here and uh, do a proper design and so uh, pattern control down to one kilohertz and so the goal here is to match the polar response of the woofer so that we have consistent even coverage through the crossover region so we also want the uh, waveguide to have a very linear transfer function in other words we need it to have a very flat linear frequency response um, most often um, if we achieve that then we can get away with just a single capacitor on the high pass which will drastically reduce the crossover complexity um, we're looking for perfect physical time alignment between the low frequency and the high frequency and so that's achieved by positioning the tweeter in the depth dimension um, so that the uh, you know there's time aligned and so that's critical uh, for maintaining coherency and also dynamics so uh, the biradial needs to be easy to 3d print and so I've designed the biradial to fit on a standard uh, 210 by 210 millimeter printer bed um, and I also want it to be flexible for um, the DIY enthusiast to experiment with other 25 millimeter dome tweeters and, and so with Horn 1900, which was a um, 50 millimeter deep circular ES horn, um, we have to go a little deeper to achieve our cutoff frequency of one kilohertz. Uh, we're trying to achieve a uh, one kilohertz crossover point, which is also the cutoff of the horn. And so uh, now needs to be 60 millimeters deep. And so you can see here uh, with the renderings, how it looks with the eight inch Purify. Um, so I am offering 3D printing services now. I have a local company that's uh, staying pretty busy uh, having them print various components for me, uh, mainly for in-house uh, development, um, but also available for customers if they need uh, 3D printed parts and are having a difficult time uh, finding uh, a local supplier for that. And so um, you can see here, this is the ES curvature in the uh, horizontal, we're sectioning through, you can see it there, wrap around to a 45 degree angle. So that's going to really help uh, with edge diffraction. You have the little dome tweeter in there and it's also showing, um, I've positioned it so that it's time aligned um, with the top plate of the Purify. Now it's uh, up for debate whether that's actually the acoustic center. Um, but um, that's a good starting point if we can get it that close to start with. And there you can see the isometric view with the section through the horn. 
uh, vertical section view as well. Um, so another thing worth noting is that it's using eight degree draft angles. You can see these two red arrows. Now this is going to help reduce uh, standing waves inside the throat and then the uh, bump which is now on all of the ES by radials which minimizes standing waves in the vertical between the floor and the ceiling of the throat of the horn. So you may be wondering why by radial? I know a lot of designs are circular horns and so it's been my experience that the by radials offer uh, better treble clarity uh, by virtue of loading the high frequencies better. And so when you look at the way that the throat geometry is shaped, it's helping load up those higher frequencies a little better than a circular horn. And so um, it's just been my observation, both in measurement and also just in the perceived sound quality. Um, getting a little more loading out of the upper treble helps with uh, just with detail and, and that. So, Okay, so I'm going to skip uh, to the next blog post where I actually have the horn printed and then I can provide you with the objective test data and my listening impressions. So um, you can see here printing was easy and straightforward. Uh, the print, um, so the horn lays flat on its back which is why the back of the horn is perfectly flat. Um, with 3D printing you really want to avoid what they call ceilings. Um, because they'll have to be infill to build up and support that ceiling. So it just adds complexity to the printing process. So if you can just keep the, the shape uh, so that there's no ceilings in the design, then you're going to be a lot less headaches uh, trying to print the horn. Okay, and so you can see here. So I just go through and uh, highlight the design goals again uh, with this. And so starting with the frequency response with the OC25 tweeter from Peerless, you can see here this is a pretty good result. Um, we do get loading not quite down to 1 kilohertz, but it's pretty close. Now doing an overlay comparison between Horn 1900 and 2007, you can see here this is 1900 in red. And so because it's a smaller horn, it's going to shift the area in the frequency bandwidth where it actually loads and so um, the you can see here with the with the uh, green we're loading a little lower and so it doesn't quite load as well in the upper treble um, so it's just kind of you got to pick right where you want that horn to operate and so it's very typical for horns to only cover around two and a half octaves and you also note too that the uh, dip that we saw at 10 kilohertz is gone with the new horn design, which is good. Um, so another aspect that I wanted to touch on was conjugate filters. And so you'll, you may want to use a conjugate filter when you're getting uh, really close to the FS of the tweeter. And so you can see here, um, this is the FS of the Peerless tweeter, which is around 1.3 kilohertz. And so because we're trying to cross uh, near the one kilohertz region, we need to implement this type of a filter, which is three uh, components, L an LCR uh, to ground, which is these values are carefully selected uh, so that it actually shunts the impedance spike to ground. And so you can see here uh, the effect of the filter in blue, and it also has an effect on the, the phase response as well. You can see that the phase is, is more linear. Uh, through that region. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to help us uh, achieve our target frequency response when implementing our passive high pass elements. And so you can see here I've done a simple uh, second order high pass filter, and you can see the conjugate in place and it's directly before the tweeter. Okay, and so by implementing that high pass and the conjugate, you can see here this is the resulting frequency response, which is extremely linear. Uh, fully devoid of any kind of anomalies. Now if we want to remove the conjugate just to see the effect it's having on our target response, you can see here the darker area. We can see that it's it's uh, creating a peak near the, the horn cutoff. And so it just kind of uh, highlights its importance, at least in this specific application. And just with conjugate filters in general, they're they're highly tailored to the specific tweeter that you're using. So you just can't um, throw in some components and have it work. It needs to be uh, very carefully designed. And another uh, thing that I'll note too um, is that it actually has to be designed 
like physically by rigging up the components and testing with measurement. Um, it's been my experience that you just simply can't use the simulation softwares, software to predict uh, what's going to happen. It's just not accurate enough. Um, you actually have to do some trial and error, um, and I suggest um, you know purchasing those alligator clips and being able to swap out components quickly. Okay, so jumping to the off-axis polar uh, map performance for the biradial, you can see here that we're getting really good, wide, consistent off-axis coverage, and so it's been uh, my experience that once you get past that 90 degree coverage pattern, if you can get up to 100, 110, uh, you're doing really well for improving that overall uh, perceived soundstage width and then because you're getting more energy into the room you're also going to get more uh, perceived source envelopment okay and so we're getting uh, really wide coverage even at 10 kilohertz which we're about uh, 100 degrees and it narrows a little bit but then it stays consistently wide so even at around 17 kilohertz we're still getting around a 90 to 100 degree listening window um, just to further highlight the uh, off-axis ability here, um, so you have the 15, 30, and 45 degrees off-axis. So you can see here that uh, we get extremely uh, clean performance, which is going to indicate uh, low coloration. Um, so I refer you to my blog post if you want to see. I've done some time domain measurements uh, with the... Um, burst decay and CSD plot with either the conjugate in place or with it removed. There really isn't much of a difference uh, in terms of the time domain. Um, if we look at distortion, um, we can see that the harmonic distortion remains low at both the 85 and 95 dB test signal. And it's in fact right into the noise floor of the Focusrite uh, Scarlet Solo mic preamp. So, um, it has a signal to noise ratio of around 90 dB, uh, which is currently the um, limit for my measurement system. And so I'm currently on the hunt for a mic preamp that uh, has a low, uh, an improved signal to noise ratio. And there are some available, you know, that are in the 115, 120 uh, degree range, 120 dB uh, range uh, for the signal to noise. And so uh, hopefully that will open up uh, even better measurements and reveal even more potential performance with these types of tweeters. So uh, looking at intermodulation distortion, I tested it at the 85 dB. You can see some uh, uh, intermodulation showing up near the cutoff of the horn, but it still is uh, minus 65 dB down. And then even at the 3 kilohertz region, we're a full minus 71 dB down. Um, so uh, we've hit the target there for IMD. And then with the subjective listening, um, I have a few reference recordings. One of them is Stacy Kent's uh, Dreamer in Concert, which is a live recording. And so it has uh, really good uh, drum brushes where you can kind of tell, um, you know, the level of detail that, that's, that's happening. And so... Um, you know, I could hear the claps of the audience distinctly, and I could also hear uh, the venue with the ambient cues. Um, everything was sounding excellent, and it's on par with uh, some of the best tweeters available. And so whether it's suitable uh, for the Project 1736 as a two-way with the Purify, um, still have to s listen to it as a stereo pair and do some critical evaluation. But so far, um, just listening to the one uh, horn, which was 3D printed, it looks like uh, it still it has certainly potential to be a candidate there. So, um, so that, that's it uh, for this video. Take care and have a great day.